Okay, let's get started. Um, all right, first off, um, I don't have it up here, but um, we have a celebration coming up. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to do what I usually do. Uh, here's the notebook. I've got the sign-in sheet. I'm going to pass this around. It's, it has all the notes, uh, homework solutions, and everything up to date. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Sign in. Let me know if you're missing something, and I will uh, print stuff off uh, for Wednesday. Okay. Uh, another thing, um, I have your homework six graded, and I'll hand that out here in a second. I also have solutions, and I have a homework seven uh, assigned for you. So if everybody remembers, all right, so here's the schedule. So I'm going to assign homework seven today. It's really short. It's only two problems. Um, I'm going to assign that today. It's going to be due on Monday. You turn it in. I give you a solution. We have our exam review on Monday, exam on Wednesday. Okay, so Wednesday, April 12th is our second exam in here. Sound good? Okay. Hopefully that doesn't conflict with any of your other exams. I've ensured you don't have anything due in steel on uh, Wednesday, April 12th. So that gives you a little bit of a buffer. Uh, sound good? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, just real quick uh, about the Virginia's conference. Uh, you all did, uh, the, or Marshall did very well. We scored second in the transportation, first in uh, concrete bowling. We got fourth overall on the bridge, and we got a very respectable score on the steel bridge. Um, uh, that score would have, I mean, we had some really steep competition, but, but on its own, that score could have, you know, was high enough or good enough, or I guess I'd say low enough, to send us to nationals. So uh, uh, ASC, if you see anybody who's on the team, tell them they did a great job. Uh, if you're, <laughs> and if you're going to be here next year, I dare you to do better. In other words, uh, that the, the cost for the bridge, the, the score, the cost score, was about 26 million, so do better. In other words, if you're interested, you know, uh, uh, you should definitely get involved. It's a lot of fun. Okay, um, before we get into development length, um, I'm going to pass out uh, your homework uh, six, and then we'll pass out the solution uh, here in a second. So, um, let's. Oh, this is the this is the homework you all turned in. This is the homework I'm giving back to you. All right. Okay. So. Mr. Adkins. Mr. Kirchhanks. Mr. Foreman. Mr. Lewis. Mr. Labern. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mays. Mr. McCracken's not here. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. O'Neill. Oh, here. Here, get, and give that to Mr. Scarberry. Once for... Oh. Uh, not with me. Here in a second.
Okay, let me pass out the solution and then uh, homework seven uh, as well, since I'm in the passing out mode right now, passing out stuff mode. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, I think it was little stuff on everybody's. It's little things, like I track mine in like the software, so it, it's little stuff. One, two, three, four, five. Here's that. They're they're pretty repetitive. Like honestly, I would I would explore using Excel or something like that to make your life a little easier. You don't have to, but it's going to be a lot of the same calcs over and over again. Um, let me pull up the the homework six solution just to show you all. Um, so real quick, um, the only thing I would mention, okay, so problem one, very plug and chug. You should have got a shear capacity of about 53.2 kips. Um, problem two, I think what I'm most interested in is that you understood what was going on here. So this is the shear diagram. So basically you need to uh, place dirt from x equals zero to x equals about 87 inches. Um, this problem was a little more typical. You have a very clearly designed or a defined region where you need stirrups. You just need to provide them uh, based on the code and then a region where you don't need them at all. Um, I have, uh, this is the design that I came up with uh, just following the, the starting value and the S max and just following the spec and I got um, one at two, four at nine and four at 13. Um, so, and that worked out actually uh, quite exactly. Um, so I ended up using nine stirrups on one end or 18 stirrups uh, total. So that, that, was my, uh, that was my design. Problem three, I think, is the one that gave everybody uh, a little bit of heartburn. Uh, the, pr the thing with problem three was there, you know, you got a shear diagram that looked like this, and a lot of you were getting X values that are, that are negative. You're like, what, what's going on here? The thing with problem three is that the beam was just really big on its own. And it could handle, you know, just on its own, it could handle the shear load. The code says, though, we only need to provide stirrups up, up till about like 65 or so inches. If you calculate your X at PVC and you get a negative value, you're like, what's going on here? Well, your V sub U at the supports, like what about like 45 kips or something like that? And then your VVC was larger than that, so your equation's trying to do this and get a negative value. Didn't matter because you didn't need them anyway. So all I did was this. I calculated S max, got S max to be 13 inches, and then I said, well, start your first stirrup at 2 inches and just use 13 till you're done. That was it. So like, that's all you needed. So <laughs> that was pretty much it on, uh, uh, on problem three. All in all, again, you all did very well. Um, no, no real big concerns. Um, sound good? Yeah. When, on problem two, when you're calculating the X, you get the uh, V sub U. It has to be 38.05. Can you speak down about the second page? And not when you have that extra to get that extra five minutes? So let me see. Let me see.
mysticism. Could it have been rounding? Because I got my, I mean, I got mine, it was like 38, like pretty much. Yeah. How many rounded up? Mm. Okay. I'm in a giving mood. I think it was what, a half a point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. All right first, I, it, guys, it's a half a point. You should, yes, yes, yes. All right. I don't want the point back. I just want to know what's chosen. No, I want the point. Okay. First off, first off, look, in the interest of, first, in the interest of being, re it's a half a point. But? I'll tell you a funny story and then we'll move on. I'll, t I'll tell you a funny story. Is it about you bowling? No, it's not about me bowling, but I, but, but, oh, I saw it. I'll tell that story here in a second. I'll tell that story and I'll be honest. I'll be honest. All right. Give me a sec. I'll, I'll tell you a real story real quick. So I was in grad school and I took a class called Experimental Stress Analysis and it was about, it was actually a little bit of electrical engineering, it's a little bit of mechanics, it's a little bit of everything. But the idea was, if you're doing an experiment, how do you instrument it to measure the response? And then, you know, like if you get some like voltage reading, how do you convert that back to strain and all this? And we had this problem on the exam where it was a torsional shaft being twisted, and the gauge was placed at a 45 degree angle, and you got some voltage reading. So how did you back calculate the strain? Well, um, I. Uh, I, in order to do it, I used more circle. You know, there were two strain values, so I, I more circle, use more circle to rotate them. And the professor said, "Oh, you you weren't supposed to do that. You just uh, uh, calculate the strain, and move on." And we we're like, "No, there's there's two strain values there because your gauge is at 45 degrees." And we argued with him for a good like it was me and about half the class all did the same thing. And we argued with him for, for a while until we convinced him that, yeah, we, we really needed to do that. So he took off five points for everybody who made that mistake. We all gave our exams back to him, and he gave us four points back. I was like, really? Really? So, yeah. That was the moral of the story, right? Um, so I'll I tell you what I'll do. Um, where's the notebook? You have it. Has everybody seen it? <laughs> I love this job. <laughs> who, who all has not seen the notebook? Has everybody seen? Not the movie. The <laughs> All right. Let me know when you're done, and I'll just pass the sign-in sheet around. And I and I, it's half a point, so I'm not going to lose any heartburn over it. So if you uh, uh, if you or if you tell me you half a point, you'll get your half a point. So. <laughs> My God. <laughs> now I'm not telling the bowling story. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sure that. <laughs> All right. Here's the story. So, uh, we we had our concrete bowling competition at uh, ODU, and um, the, there was a student three frame bowling, and then we were just sitting around, and they they rounded up some professors, some of the faculty advisors, and said, okay, we'll bowl a frame apiece and compete against each other. And all the bowls, uh, all the balls were, were were massive, except for ours. So my first throw, I launched it. Like, I mean, like aerial, a good, you know, half, halfway down the, uh, the, um, the, the lane. It was pretty bad. Um, I'll be the first person to admit it. Now, what they're not going to tell you is that the second, which that was just my practice throw. 
The second one, I knocked down more pens than any of the other faculty. I just said I launched it. No, no, <laughs> no, I, okay, all right, all right. Hey, the third one didn't knock down any pens either, but that one wasn't for lack of trying. That one just sort of rolled off. Hey, hey, I still won that, right? Yes, I did, didn't I? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, listen to this. Now, in all, in all fairness, yet yeah, the ball was very nice. It, the the blue or the, some of the other ones, they didn't have holes in it. On I would have, oh, it would have been bad. When you, I guess, pour it the night before and you don't have time. <laughs> All right. Development link. Did everybody get, uh, okay, so did everybody get the homework? Did everybody get the homework six solution? Did everybody get their homework back? All right. Let's talk about concrete design then. Um, I think, I, if, unless I'm mistaken, I did sort of slightly go over this last time. Very, very slightly. Okay, so this is, a, a, in my opinion, a, a very important topic in reinforced concrete design. It is also an incredibly simple one, okay, because um, uh, the equation, I know it looks long and, and messy, but I think you're going to find that um, actually employing this, um, uh, employing this technique and employing this equation, this is probably one of the simplest things we do this entire semester uh, is development link. So to discuss the concept of development link, I want to look at this beam. Now let's let's sort of take stock of what's going on here. Okay. So I have uh, a beam that's got three ksi concrete. So, so every, all right, all right, all right. So we have a beam that's three ksi concrete at 60 ksi steel. The beam is 18 inches wide. It has an effective depth of 27 inches, and the reinforcement is six number nine. So I've got to believe that by now, given that cross-section and those material parameters, you can beat BMN. Am I right? If you, I mean, that's, you should be experts at that by now. Okay. Now, in addition, we have a beam that's 30 foot long, and it's being subjected to a factored load. We'll say for the purposes, that includes the beam self-weight. Uh, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of what we're talking about. So uh, WU is 5.5 kips per foot, and the beam length is 30 foot long. So if I have a, a distributed load of 5.5 kips per foot and um, uh, the beam length is 30 foot long, how do I get my moment? Okay, W all squared over 8, right? Now, in fairness, that's only kind of right, okay? What I mean by that is W all squared over 8 is just the peak of your moment diagram, right? That's the key word, though, is moment diagram, right? WL squared over 8 is just the moment at the very mid, uh, mid span, middle of the beam. The moment diagram does that, right? A parabolic you know, curve. So that's what your moment diagram looks like. What if we actually took that into account when we really designed uh, the beam? You know, think, we got six number nines, right? We got six number nines. We selected six number nines of reinforcement based on the moment right there. But are we taking those six number nines and using them everywhere? Why? Do we need that much reinforcement right here? I mean, do we? I mean, I mean think about it. The, what's the mo if, if the moment right here is 618.75, what's the moment right there? I don't think it's 618.75, right? Probably lower. About two. Yep, you're exactly right. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this. We could optimize our design a little bit by um, actually taking into account the moments across the span. You all remember this, right? You've got a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load. 
samurai sword or lightsaber or cake cutter through the bridge or through the beam, cut a section, look either to the left or to the right. In this case, we're looking to the left, so let's break out those structural analysis skills, right? So we have a reaction here. Remember our reaction, WUL over 2, right? Okay. WUL over 2 at, at our section, a moment arm of X. We have our distributed load, which is WU times X at a moment arm of X over 2, right? Remember, we don't deal with that distributed load. We collapse that into a single point load, right? So WU times X at a moment arm of X over 2. <coughs> and then we solve for our moment equation, and we get this. Now, this is a parabola, right? We have an X squared. Doesn't, doesn't that make sense? That's our moment diagram, right? Everybody good? Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, okay, let's look at the moment capacity then of the beam. Would you agree that the moment capacity of this beam, if I have a singly reinforced beam, area of steel, FY, it's got depth, all that, that the moment, moment capacity is uh, ASFY times D minus A over 2, right? Everybody good with that? Now, ASFY D minus A over 2 adjusted by phi would be our design capacity, right? Sound good? Now, I've got six bars in this beam. So what, I, what I'm saying is that here's the capacity of this, uh, of this beam. Now, if I use six bars, an area of seal six square inches, plug and chug, I get a FEMN of about 623.12, okay? Now that's good, right? This is a FEMN of 623.12. The maximum moment is 618.75. That's good, right? That's, an, that, that's what we want. But what I'm saying is that we don't need that reinforcement everywhere, okay? If I considered only four bars, here would be my moment capacity. And my point is I could start using four bars Maybe, I don't know, somewhere about right there, whenever my moment diagram hit that 438. Maybe if I've got two bars, 231, whenever it hit that point right there. Uh, my point is, if I can do a little bit of math, figure out where that moment occurs on the moment diagram, just take that, set it equal to zero, solve for x, I can get that uh, for four bars, that moment occurs at around an x value of about six or seven, or what is it, six, 6.92 feet, so I'm saying start here, go in 6.92 feet, that's where that moment occurs. The point is, is that I can take these moment capacities and I can do this. So I want everybody to make sure they understand what we're looking at here, okay? So this is the support and this is the center line of the beam and I'm looking at the reinforcement down like this. So up until now, we've been saying we'll just use six bars all the way across the beam, right? What I'm saying, though, is that theoretically, we could cut that off. We don't need all those bars all the way along the beam. We could actually cut it off and save a little bit of a, a rebar. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, theoretically, this is fine. Here's the problem, okay? The problem is that it ignores the entire concept of bond strength. We had this example last time. Uh, remember when I said, okay, if I'm going to play tug of war with somebody, all right, and I get to hold as much of the rope as I want, but you only get to hold about that much, who's going to win? Doesn't, what? Yeah, it does, it won't the most leverage. It doesn't matter how strong the opponent is because they don't have as much grip on the rope. Make sense? So um, if by cutting off the bars at those theoretical locations, they're not really embedded into the beam far enough to develop that capacity. To give you a, an easier example, I think, to understand, look at this, okay? Let's look at the beam on the left and the beam on the right. Now, both of these beams are cantilevered beams being subjected to loads, distributed loads, concentrated loads, it doesn't matter, okay? Right now, you all can very adequately or should be very adequately able uh, to select the amount of reinforcement. Maybe you need, you know, eight number seven bars or, or what have you, okay? But think about it, okay? Here's this beam. Where's maximum moment occur on this beam? It's a cantilevered beam, right? Right here, right? Are you telling me that this bar doesn't need to be embedded in this beam at all? 
This bar right here is supporting a whole heck of a lot of moment. If you do not take this bar and embed it into the beam, are you sure you've provided enough reinforcement, but you haven't developed it? This bar has got the same issue as the tug of war, right? It can support a lot of load, but it's not embedded, so there's nothing to grip on. If, if I did this, the beam would just fall, right? I have to take that bar and actually embed it into the concrete a little bit, okay? How far? I need to embed it along its development length, okay? Now, what ends up here, let's, let's, sort of, let's sort of go back a little bit and explain what's going on. So first off, how, how does this work? Well, rebar, as you've seen, has ribs on it, right? It, it's not just a, a smooth, solid bar. It has ribs. Those ribs are cast around the concrete, and they grip the concrete, okay? The farther you cast a bar into a piece of concrete, the more capacity it can develop because it's got more surface area to, uh, to grip onto the concrete. Make sense? Okay. <coughs> All right, so more ribs that are embedded in the concrete, the more capacity that we get. So, you know, you all see what uh, uh, rebar looks like. I'm sure you all know that uh, by now. <coughs> now, what ends up happening when you start uh, ripping out uh, concrete uh, is you get, you, what we're trying to do essentially is uh, avoid um, bond failures. Now, bond failures, whoop, a remote's pooping out on me a little bit. Bond failures tend to look like a, uh, like a cylindrical section. So if, if I have, let's say I have some beam and I have a bar and I'm yanking on it, when it fails, it tend to, tends to fail along this sort of like cylindrical shape uh, like this. You go down to the lab and you start testing bond failures, this tends to be what they look like. Uh, the analogy, actually the analogy uh, behaviorally is a lot like a, a, a pipe filled with water. That sort of cylindrical failure uh, tends to be uh, what happens. I, I really want this idea to kind of make sense because we're going to look at some distances, some CB distances in a little bit. These CB distances are going to be related to sort of these cylindrical chunks of the, of the member failing uh, due to bond failure. If you understand this sort of uh, failure phenomenon, then development length, I think you're going to find, is really simple. Okay, everybody okay with this? Okay. Now, again, the idea is to try and determine how far a piece of rebar needs to be embedded into concrete in order to develop its full capacity. This, this problem or this, this uh, 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 issue that we need to tackle occurs all over the place. I mean, in geotech, if you got a cantilever retaining wall, You've got the wall, you've got the foundation. There's rebar tying that wall to that foundation. Well, how far does that rebar need to be embedded? It needs to be embedded up to its development length. Okay? Does this make sense? All right. Now, here's the formula. I know it looks nasty. A lot of this you've already seen, and the, the only new factors, the psi factors, are pretty simple. Okay? Um, start off. So, um, what 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 don't or what what do we what have we seen and what do we not know? Okay. So we've got F Y right. We've got lambda and F C prime. We know what all these are, right? We've seen these before. Okay. We have a, a new set of uh, adjustment factors that we haven't seen. We'll take these one at a time. We've got a reinforcement location factor, a bar coating factor, and then a reinforcement size factor. Um, let's see. We've got some, some stuff with this C sub B and this KTR. We'll take these one at a time. We also have D sub B. D sub B is the, uh, the bar diameter, okay? Sound good? Now, regardless of whatever you calculate, your development length is never taken to be smaller than, than 12 inches. So, for instance, you might have like a really tiny piece of rebar and you do the calculation and you really don't need but more than a few inches to develop its capacity, no. You have to uh, cast it in at least uh, at least 12 inches. Sound good? There, there we are. All right. Okay. All right. So let's take these one at a time. Okay. Uh, let's start off with our reinforcement location factor. Um, it's called psi sub t because a lot of times it's thought of as the top bar factor. Um, if you go down and do tests or, or instrument structures, you'll find that bars on the top or on the upper portion of the beam, they tend to just not bond as well as, as uh, bars near the bottom. So uh, what we do is this. We start looking at the, uh, the, the dimensions of the beam, and we say that for top bars, 
with more than 12 inches of concrete cast below. So if this dimension is larger than 12 inches, we'll sort of consider those to be a top bar. And we take our psi factor to be 1.3. Now, let's be clear about what these psi factors do. If a psi factor is larger than 1, what's it going to do to our development length? Make it bigger. So since top bars don't really tend to bond well uh, as other bars, if we do have a top bar, which the spec defies as any bar that has more than 12 inches of concrete cast below, we're going to take the psi factor and increase it a little bit. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, um, that, that the behavior is going to change a little bit if the elements in compression or the elements in tension are right. Um, I would argue that, that um, maybe that's worth looking at, that maybe there should be some additional testing to see, well, if you've got compressive stresses versus tensile stresses, maybe your top bar factor changes a little bit. And you might, you're probably on to something. Um, what I would also say is this. Um, there is a point with some of these calculations where you kind of have to ask yourself, wait a minute, am I making it too complicated? You, you know what I mean? Um, whether or not, uh, you know, this is a pretty simple uh, relationship. It's either 1.3 or it's 1. Now we have a whole host of other ones we're going to have to memorize. If I take this and make it more and more complicated and take the entire equation and make it more and more complicated, maybe I'm missing the point. You see what I mean? So I agree that that's worth looking at. And if there's a simple empirical way to address it, I think we should. For now, the code really doesn't uh, account for it. And everybody's, I guess, at least from the code specification standpoint, everybody's all right with it. I, I will say that th these things and their, their notation does change. Uh, we're currently on ACI 318.14. On the last spec, uh, the notation around this actually changed a little bit. So I know this stuff does uh, continuously get, uh, get updated. Um, I agree it's worth looking at, but there's a risk of making it too complicated. Does that make sense? And again, this is all empirical. This is all just going down, collecting data, and trying to find the, the simplest model that you can. Sound good? All right. So, any, so if we're talking about the beam in our last example, you know, something like, like this. These would not be top bars, and our development length would just be, or our psi t factor would be 1. Sound good? Okay. Now, that's psi t. Let's talk about psi sub e. So psi sub e is our bar coding factor. It's called psi sub e because it tends to stand for, uh, or a lot of people think of this as the epoxy factor. And we, I think we did talk about this last time, right? Um, if you've got a, a bare steel rebar versus a piece of rebar that's been epoxy coated, What's the issue if we're talking about bond strength? What, what was the adjective? It was, it was slippery, right? So a slippery piece of rebar is not going to bond as well as an uncoated piece of rebar, so you're going to need more development length. Yes? You mean like actually like manufacture like a different rebar? I think it's worth looking at. I mean, I think that would be a, a, a good research project to see if actually developing a new piece of rebar would actually improve it. Um, I know nowadays um, there's a push, though, to actually get away from epoxy coated rebar altogether and just galvanize it. If you hot dip galvanize it, then you're going to get the, added, the added extra layer of corrosion protection with, with this not being an issue. So. Depending upon your, your cost, that might actually be the way to go. It's simpler, and you solve the problem. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, you'd have to assess it, but I, I, I don't really think so. so. Um, Okay, so everybody agrees, though, that, I mean, epoxy-coated rebar is still used. And if you do use epoxy-coated rebar, you're going to have to have a farther embedment into your, your adjacent structure. Sound good? Okay, so this is how this is hand, handled. Okay, so first off, an uncoated bar, psi is 1, okay? One of the things you'll notice is that 
for regular situations, a lot of these adjustment factors just go back to one. Okay, so it, it's it's pretty straightforward. Okay, now if you have an epoxy coated bar with a low cover, I mean, let's keep in mind, cover is how much concrete is surrounding a given bar, right? The less concrete you have surrounding a bar, the less grip that concrete is going to be able to provide, right? So if you don't have a lot of grip, you're going to have to adjust your development length by a lot. I mean, we said epoxy coated bars are slippery. So your psi factor for epoxy coated bars with a cover less than three times the bar diameter or a clear spacing less than six times the bar diameter, your psi factor is 1.5. So you're going to have to take that development length and up it 50%. Now, if you have an epoxy coated bar that does have ample cover, that doesn't mean you have a psi value of 1. It's a psi value of 1.2. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. Okay. This one, this one takes a little bit of uh, thought when, when you think, uh, but, I, but I think it makes sense if you really sort of delve into it. So reinforcement size factor. Okay. Now, I have here tests shown that smaller bars require less development length, but I don't know that the tests are really necessary if you just think about it. Okay. Let me give you an example. All right. So you all, have, uh, you all by now know how to design a beam, right? You can uh, size the beam and you can select the reinforcement for it. Sound good? Now let's say, and, and I know I'm going to get the numbers off, and that, that's, no, that's not really a big deal for, for my, my example, but let's say that you need, you do the math, you can carry it out, and you need 6.5 square inches of steel, right? And there's two ways that you could, uh, you could achieve that. You could use seven number nines, or you could use like 24 number threes. Sounds silly, but everybody with me on that, right? Now, I want to talk about that from a bond strength standpoint. There would be one advantage to using 24 number threes as opposed to your seven number nines. You'd have the same area. Let's say it was the same area of steel. I'm just trying to... Use, use numbers, for example. I'm sure it's off. I'm, you know, if you go through and check the chart, I'm sure it's off. But my point is, is that more bars for the same area of steel provides more surface area, right? More bars, you're going to have more surface area, more room for the concrete to grip. So you don't need as much of a length to develop that steel because there's more area. Make sense? So if, here's the way the code handles that. The code says if you have a bar that's a number six bar and smaller, you can actually get a benefit and say, well, my psi factor only needs to be 0.8. Okay? But for most of the beams designed in this class, we were using like number eights and number nines and things like that. And for most of those regular you know, uh, 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 capacity uh, uh, sized uh, bars, those are normal bars. Let's just take a uh, psi to be one. Sound good? That makes sense. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, what else? Okay. So let's talk about the effects of uh, spacing and cover. Okay. So first off, that C sub B value. Okay. Now that C sub B value is um, a distance, basically measuring the distance from the center of a bar to your next, uh, uh, I guess, adjacent layer of concrete. If that makes any sense. But really, this C sub B value is trying to encapture that um, cylindrical bond failure that you would get. If I take this bar and I yank it, okay, would you agree I'm probably going to get some cracking in the concrete, right? None at all? There's only two types of concrete, wet and cracked. I thought I was going to that. If I take this bar and I yank on it, I'm going to get some cracking. What I was saying about that cylindrical failure is I'm proposing that if you take a piece of rebar and yank it out of a, a, a portion of concrete, the failure is going to be kind of cylindrical in nature. And so what we're doing from an, an assumption standpoint is we're assuming that failure is going to look something about like this, and that, that cylinder, the radius of that cylinder, is either going to be the smallest of, we'll say, CB1, CB2, or CB3. So either from this bar, we'll say, to the edge up here, to the edge up here, or halfway over to the next bar. So I noticed on a lot of our design problems, we really didn't 
talk about you know how far apart those bars were spaced. Well, now it it kind of matters. Okay, does that make sense? So that, that's sort of that assumption we're making that the concrete's just sort of cracking like that. So we're trying to figure out what that cylindrical surface looks like. Sound good? So that's what CB is. DB is just your bar diameter. What about KTR? KTR is your transverse reinforcement. Transverse reinforcement, what do you think they mean by transverse reinforcement in a beam? What's that? No, no, not quite. Your stirrups. We're talking about stirrups essentially. Okay? Your stirrups, I mean, what do you think they do to the concrete? They confine it. What do you think that's going to do to your bond strength? All right? We'll bump it up a little bit. So your transverse reinforcement index is essentially taken as 40 times the area of transverse reinforcement, which is basically just your AV, your, your shear stirrup area divided by the center to center spacing of transverse reinforcement, which is just stirrup spacing, and then the number of bars, the largest number of bars in a single tension layer. So in, in this case, for this beam, would be three, three bars in a single layer. What I'm saying, what, okay, what I'm saying is this. Okay, so this ratio is trying to account for how the concrete is going to fail, how bond failure is going to occur, right? So let, let, let's just numerically kind of see what happens, okay? Let's start off with KTR, okay? So let's say KTR, which is your transverse reinforcement ratio, your transverse reinforcement index, let's say it gets larger, okay? What that's essentially saying is that the concrete around your bar offers more confinement. So if I, if I have a, a piece of rebar right here and I'm yanking on it and the concrete surrounding that rebar had better confinement, you think that's going to help my development length? You think I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have to embed that bar as far? I mean, you tell me. If I've got more confinement, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing, right? And by good thing, that means it's going to take this development length and make it go down, right? I don't want to have to embed the bar 60 inches if I can only embed it 40 inches. Make sense? Okay. So what I'm saying is more confinement is a good thing. So now let's look numerically. If this value goes up, right, what happens to my development length? Goes down, right? Does that make sense? Okay. If that makes sense, then let's talk about CB, and then I'll get to your question here in a second. Okay. So let's talk about CB. So CB. What that's trying to account for is this, okay? So here is my, my, my rebar. I'm taking this rebar and I'm yanking on it, okay? Now when I take this rebar and yank on it, I propose that I'm going to get some cracks in the concrete, right? Those cracks are gonna travel, okay? So let's say I'm talking about this bar right here, so I'm yanking on it. Those cracks are gonna travel to about right here and about right here, and then that's when failure is gonna occur and that bar is not gonna be able to develop that more capacity. Sound good? Now, let me ask a question. Let's say I took this bar and I moved it like here. Do you think that would increase the capacity or decrease the capacity? If I'm yanking on it, right? See what I mean? Okay, what if I took this bar and moved it right here? You think it's going to be easier to yank out or harder to yank out? easier, right? So what I'm getting at is the larger this clear distance, the more, the stronger the bar is, the less development I need. Do you make sense? Does that make sense? So if this value goes up, I don't need as much development length. Does that make sense? Yes. How would it be affected if, you know? I mean, if we had... In the embedment, you have an L... I mean, this. Yeah. We'll get to that. We will get to that. Okay, so... 
in this instance, we just use the one right here, the one closest to the support. Yep. No, 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 no just use that, that first increment. That two inches is just to get a start. That's good stuff. Any other questions? This is important. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this. Okay, so here's my beam, right? Okay, so I'm yanking on this. Cracks right here, right? Okay, but what I'm saying is in real life, I'm going to have stirrups right here, right? What do you think those stirrups are going to do to this concrete right here? They're going to help prevent it from cracking. See what I mean? So that helps me out, right? That would, that would, that would uh, mean that the bar gets a little bit stronger. So that would ultimately mean I don't need as much development length. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? This is important stuff. I really want this to make sense. Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay. All right, so a couple other things. So, so we've got our temperature, or, our, or sorry, our top bar location factor. We've got our epoxy coating factor. We've got our bar size factor. Uh, yep, bar size factor. Okay, a couple other things. Okay, so this ratio, um, to be conservative, the code specifies that whatever this ratio is, it is limited to 2.5. In other words, uh, just a safeguard against getting weird values when you compute this. I mean, let's keep in mind, this is an empirical expression, okay? And I'm sure you all by now have used empirical equations. I mean, we've been using them in here all semester. 0.85 FC prime is just an estimate. It's an assumption. It's a really, really good assumption, but it's just that. It's just an empirical relationship. This is another empirical relationship. One of the disadvantages of using empirical relationships is if you start going outside the boundaries of how they were developed, you can get some odd answers. This is just the code's way of just sort of safeguarding that you don't, don't get a development length that doesn't really make sense. Whatever this ratio is computed to be, it has to be uh, capped off at 2.5. So to calculate a value of 4, no, 2.5 is the max. Um, transverse uh, uh, reinforcement uh, index, everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, computing development length, there's a couple other uh, factors to consider. Um, if you've got top bars that are epoxy coated, um, the combined effect, I mean, that, that would not be very good, but the, the product of those two values are going to be limited to, uh, to 1.7, so just make sure that you, off the side, make sure that you're, you're limiting that accordingly. And this is another one that's really uh, important. You can reduce the, uh, the required development length based on the difference between how much steel you needed and how much steel you provided. Now, now, what do I mean by that? Let's go back to our, uh, that example I was mentioning earlier. So what did I say? You go through and you do the math and you calculate a required area of 6.5 square inches, right? Then I, what was my first example? Was that, did I say seven number nines? What's the area of seven number nines? Seven. seven. So in that instance, I provided more steel than was needed, right? Sound good? I only needed 6.5 square inches, but I provided 7. That, and that's always going to happen, right? That's always, I mean, you're never going to get exactly on it. You know, you're going to round up on your bar chart and find the next increment, right? You can take the ratio of how much steel is required versus how much steel is uh, provided, and you can cut back your development length a little bit. What is 6.5 divided by 7? Just help me out. What is that? 0 0.929. 0 0.929. So if you need 6.5 square inches and you provide 7 square inches, you could cut your development length down by about 7% or use 93% of the value that you computed because you don't need every single bit of that steel. You provided more than was necessary. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Next time we are going to discuss this example. Now, I do want to talk about it a little bit before we, we close it. Again, I think you're going to find that this is, this is simple, okay? It really is. Um, we have a beam here. Now, if you notice, again, if you notice, there's some dimensions here that we didn't provide before. For instance, we've got three number eight bars. We never cared about this before. Well, now we do, okay? 
We have bars spaced uh, at three inches apart. This is two and a half inches, this is two and a half inches. That spacing is going to matter, okay? The transverse reinforcement uh, is gonna matter. So we're gonna compute the development length for the three uncoded number eight bars, uh, assuming either our transverse reinforcement is zero or we actually compute our transverse reinforcement uh, index. So you'll see how it's affected if you actually account for this stuff or not. We've got all of our um, material parameters and dimension related parameters. We'll have some fun with this and we'll see, uh, we'll see how this plays out. We're also gonna do another one where we have um, uh, some more uncoded bars and uh, make it a little, more, uh, a little more challenging. Sound good? We'll have some fun with this next time. All right, that's all I got for today. I will see you all on Wednesday.